Okay, calling the 929 Ways and Means Agenda to Order. So what I'm going to do is, uh, Chair's going to recommend that we defer this till um, end of calendar because the uh, info briefing is going to provide us a lot more information as to how we respond and what we do with uh, SB 582. So I'm going to recess this agenda and then call to order the info briefing. Okay, calling to order the 9.30 a.m. info briefing. And then we'll start with BNF. So while he, while he's getting ready, one of the things I want to point out is uh, the governor did send the governor's message. I think most of you know that the legislature cannot add current expenses or appropriations to the current fiscal year because it'll throw the financial plan out of whack. Only the administration can ask for for appropriations in the existing fiscal year. So we did get a governor's message. Um, it was the most unusual governor's message that I've ever seen <laughs> because um, all they did was identify a bill for an appropriation, but no request for an appropriation and no request for any language, just telling us that they, they think they're gonna exceed the 199 million. So that's where um, I know in the past, people have sent us over from the House to the Senate blank bills. So I'm not sure if this is one of those situations. Uh, but we'll hear from uh, BNF. Uh, good morning, morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, Louis Oliveria, Director of Finance for the State of Hawaii. Uh, I thank you again for the opportunity to give you the, the fiscal snapshot on where we stand today with regards to the state's financial plan, as well as the impact that the Maui wildfire is having on the state's finances uh, as we speak. So what you see up here is a little bit more of an updated number from what you saw the week before in terms of where we stand with uh, the amount of obligations that the state has made with regards to the Maui wildfire. Um, uh, go ahead and draw your attention to, uh, to some of the numbers that we are looking at uh, in here. But if you see, if you look at the bottom line numbers, if we'll just start from the bottom line and we can go into some details. Total costs that has been obligated so far with regards to disaster that we are tracking at this point in time. This does not include some expenses that may be occurring at the county level. I would let them go ahead and discuss what those numbers could be. But this is what we're tracking at the at the state level. And when you look at it, as it stands right now, where we are since the disaster, we are about $2.1 billion worth of obligations that has been incurred as a result of the Maui wildfire disaster of which 1.5 billion we expect the federal government to cover. And right now, and this is the number that's currently in flex, and again, apologies for sending down a governor's message that did not have exact details on what the amount would be. It's because this is the number that's essentially changing literally on a weekly basis. But as it stands where we are right now, we're about $611 million worth of state obligations that has been incurred so far as a result of the wildfire disaster. And that's broken down by multiple different categories, uh, such as mission assignment, the other needs assessment, as well as the emergency management assistant compact. And these are some of the, these are the items that are really that HAIMA and the state is working together on when it comes to the distribution of expenses and as well as the distribution of cost sharing between those types of costs. So as we move down into this other category, I know we, we specifically kind of highlighted the American Red Cross contract because that is currently the non-congregate sheltering contract that's currently significantly in flux due to issues related to the eligibility of uh, of people who have been housed in non-congregate sheltering. And where it stands right now with regards to the American Red Cross contract is we currently have a contract of $500 million. The distribution of which right now is about 200, it's about $250 million each between the state and the federal government. But that number is the number that's currently changing as eligibility gets determined. One of the things that did, that did come to uh, fruition from our last discussion was the FEMA's willingness now to cover uh, condos, which they previously were not going to cover. And we expect that that will actually move about 
about 40 to $50 million from the state category into the federal category. So that's not reflected in this. That's not reflected here. We're not going to reflect that until we actually get, given the experience that we have, we've had so far, we are not going to make those, uh, those adjustments in what we're looking at financially until we get confirmation that those expenses will be moving over into the federal share. So, you know, if, if I can emphasize, really, we continue to really work on, on getting additional reimbursements and making sure that the federal government uh, covers as much of the disaster expenses as possible, uh, as well as being very cognizant about, about the types of bills that will be hitting the current fiscal year, because that's the issue that, that we're looking at with regards to the emergency appropriation requirement. For the major disaster fund. So that number is the number and the reason why it's highlighted is because that's the number that 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 is moving constantly with regards to eligibility as well as our ongoing housing plan uh, and getting the number of units available so that we could move people out of non-congregate sheltering into short and long-term housing at a much more reduced cost. And, and I'll so let the, the, which which numbers are the most variable? Yeah, that is the number right there. It is this number. So the rest are pretty. The rest are pretty are, are pretty solid, yes. But as you can see, of the two point one billion dollars that's been committed so far, five hundred million, okay. twenty five percent of that is really in this one particular contract. Okay, so the only there. cost that we see we can't seem to get a real number on is the sheltering. Is the sheltering cost right now? So once we can get a better number on sheltering, then we can have a better idea of the real financial plan. Yes, absolutely. So why did the Red Cross contract go from 300 to 500? The original contract for 300 took us out to February. Uh, and so the additional $200 million contract amendment, and, and I can let- uh, And when was Barrow that signed? Talk about, that was signed on February 9th. Or Yes, the current contract right now for 500 million takes us out to the end of June. Okay, and the governor signed that? And the governor has signed the contract amendment for five hundred million. You know, so if that if that's the one category that's the most alarming, when the administration signed that, why didn't the alarm alarm bells go on? I uh, the, the alarm bells uh, have been going on quite significantly, especially as we started the the second. Well, actually, it would have been the third contract amendment, I think, that took us to 500. Uh, because once you went over the 200, the initial 199, what was the plan? Because uh, that would have brought you over the 199. Yes. So as we were, if you look at the progression of events and the chronology of events, you know, a lot of the issues associated with eligibility happened uh, really in the end of January and early February at the time that the financial plan as well as the original budget was already submitted because we submitted that budget back on December 18th. So uh, the variability of the plan as well as the, the I guess, the, the news of eligibility essentially happened while the legislature was in session. So you're saying from December 17th, to the beginning of February, we went from 199 million to needing an additional 350. For the major disaster fund. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So because in just two months. In two we, months. We more than we yes. more than doubled the expenses. We more than doubled the obligation, actually. Expenses are again, again, when bills come in and when invoices come in, and I believe. When I originally uh, well, th presented. these are these are monies that the department already committed to spending, though. Correct. So uh, again, being very you know, honest about is that how did CAC. that happen? How did that happen? I you know I will, I will say that the the, the disaster and as expenses were coming in. But why 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 not take a more proactive approach, where the administration would say. Okay, what's your plan? We need to budget for it. Seems like the op it was the opposite. You just keep telling us how much you're spending. And I believe in the past, it, and, and it occurred probably before at the beginning of session, the idea of what the state wants to accomplish with regards to the overall housing plan. I mean, the housing plan is really essentially the, the area where we see the biggest exposure of expenditures. 
Uh, and, you know, that plan as it's been coming together, as well as working with the county in terms of what their needs are, uh, you know, I'd have to defer to the to the operational people with regards to how yeah, that so plan who, who, really kind of who directs the operational guys to say you have to stay within your budget. If you are going to exceed your budget, you got to let me know by X date. Yeah, I, I, that, why, why isn't why aren't those safeguards in place? Th those safeguards are are in place. It's just when the news comes to us and. No, well, you again, didn't. Yeah, but you didn't. You didn't know that this 350 was coming. I did not know this 350 was coming uh, when we prepared the budget for original submission. And that's one of the yeah. reasons. So was, were there any the budget provided to, or budget caps provided to the department saying, okay, this is your budget. You can't exceed it. If you're going to exceed it, you got to let us know. When we originally came in, we projected that it would be about $200 million worth of obligations at the state. Okay, so why, why weren't the... Why weren't the departments telling you ahead of time? We're probably going to exceed what you provided us. So, if was any department given an, a certain amount, a, a limit, I, I understand what you're saying, Chair, and and I think as the disaster progresses, because that's how we do normal budgeting. Yeah, uh, yeah. under normal every, circumstances, every department yeah, has I, a certain I, amount that says. Yes. Absolutely, I would agree under normal circumstances. Because what's happening be. now is if we don't pass the emergency appropriation, it's going to have to come out of the departments. So this amount here is going to have to get somehow. It's one of the reasons why it's extremely important that we uh, we move some kind of emergency appropriation for a value for. Yeah, but but I what I think I'm what some of us are uncomfortable with is we provide the emergency appropriation and the the culture of just let me know how much you're spending is going to continue. That got to stop. There has to be some safeguards in place telling each department, this is how much you have. You got to work within it. And if you need it more than that, you got to let us know. Hey. That, that's not, that doesn't seem to be occurring because the fact that you're telling us it's going to continue to change, which means you're not giving them any limits. I understand what you're saying. And I believe the issue or one of the reasons why it continues to change is this issue of eligible eligible expenses for reimbursement and one of the one of the things that we did institute in the you know in the aftermath of addressing the issue of eligibility was the new em so any expenditure that is perceived at some point in time to not be eligible will still will will, will now require an approval process that goes all the way up to the governor so that he is aware of expenses that the state is incurring. Yeah, but that's still after the fact. It is, it is still after the fact. I, I mean, what I'm saying is each department needs to develop a plan. Yes. And say, this is how much our, we think our plan is going to cost. And then you can anticipate those costs, regardless of if they're co covered by FEMA or not. And and that is, that is so something when, that... When is that culture to, going to change then? That the, I... Above your pay grade. It, <laughs> uh, to, I mean, well, I think they just said that the other. Uh, but I, I, I think that um, you know, in my particular role, I do have a significant amount of of influence and control, and you know, yeah, knowing the, it after the fact, where you could say, okay, I can't, I'm not going to pay for that. That like, is, that doesn't mean that you have oversight over another department saying, I want your plan. I understand. Yes, but how? I mean, I'm not sure if someone from the governor's office or. Yes, we're we're working with uh, as it stands right now. Uh, we are working with every department uh, that is intimately involved with the disaster to make sure that they are looking at what their projected expenses are going to be. Not just for for this, because we are talking about things, and I know this came up in the last uh, in the last hearing too as well. Uh, not just the building of housing, but what are going to be the operational costs associated with maintaining this housing going forward? So there's all of these questions that 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 we're working through the process. And and again, we're talking about seven. Yeah, those things are not surprises, right? We all knew that we had to build housing. We have, you know, I oh, don't yes. think that that's like a surprise. Yes. So the, the housing was never a surprise. I believe the surprise was primarily the the issue of eligible eligibility no i know i get that but even without that issue you still need to make sure that there's housing available yes regardless of that issue yes. of eligibility and but there hasn't necessarily been a housing plan 
in place so that we can shut down the sheltering. Because if that's what you're telling us, the sheltering is went from 300 million to 500 million. Why didn't at that point the alarm bells go on and say, hey, we got to get a housing plan before this contract keeps going any higher. We and, can't afford this. And, th and that did occur. When, when the, when the contract even, did you're, increase. So you're saying that we're going to be able to extend you know, a little longer for, for sheltering. We can cover it. Yes. So what's the drop dead deadline? Because yet when we had the last meeting and another senator asked you, when are we going to run out of money? I said 2025. End of 2025. And uh, and that's with, uh, with, without a real plan. So if we continue the, the strategy of just tell us how much you're spending versus saying you got to live within this amount, it might be even sooner than June. We would love for it to be sooner than June. Absolutely. To run out of money? <laughs> no, I mean uh, to, to have a plan in place. I'm yeah, kidding. I'm saying if you yeah. don't have a plan in place. Yes. And the strategy is just the, the existing one, which is just tell me how much you're spending mm -hmm. and we're going to keep adding it up. Yeah. As we begin to hit the caps and, and in terms of what the MDF was allotted. You for still need the housing plan because the more we put into sheltering, that's less we're putting into real housing and infrastructure. Correct. And so I'm not sure where, I mean, we've been asking this for a couple of weeks and 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 I will defer to the people that are putting together the plan right now to walk walk through what they've uh, you know what they've come up with with regards to the okay. The so why don't you go into the financial plan then? Because okay. the financial plan should let us know how much you've budgeted for sheltering. So your, your emergency appropriation asset is going to include the 350 that you just showed us. Correct. And the one Ohana fund, which is 65 million. Correct. So that's 415 million now. Uh, as it stands right now, it is 400. Yes, 400 and 412 actually. Yeah. But... 3 million at that point, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Call it for 420, 415. Oh, thank you. Uh, you may have it in front of you, uh, uh, senators, uh, but if I can just walk through where we are with the plan and how the plan was, was essentially, uh, laid out. Uh, and we laid out the plan here to basically show you what we were looking at, uh, in December and, and then where we are right now with regards to a lot of the changes that have happened. When we submitted a budget back to you in December, uh, in December, uh, we projected that the ending balance for FY24 was going to be a little over a billion dollars, right? Uh, but since then, uh, as you can see, we're going to start including now the estimated share for the wildfire cost right now, which at this point in time is the $612 million that was in a previous uh, slide that I just showed. Yeah, so wait, real quick though, the 199 currently is comprised of what? The 199 is comprised of uh, thirty million dollars. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about well the expenses. How did you cover the one ninety nine? Oh yeah. So we we what we used is we took approximately a hundred and sixty million dollars worth of uh, internal uh, adjustments to the budget. We took specific appropriations. We we took general funded uh, CIP projects and moved them over into yeah. CIP. So how much did you withhold from the departments to tell them, okay, you can't spend so because I got to move some of that money to one hundred and sixty four million dollars. So just to let you guys know, that's what happened. So the departments are eating part of this. Yes, and, and that's that number right here, one hundred and sixty four point one million dollars that we redirected from individual. Uh, appropriations from departments into the major disaster fund. Uh, we also took $30 million from the Section 5 proviso of the budget bill, and that was a $200 million discretionary fund, and there was approximately $5 million that was already in the major disaster fund at the start of the year, and that brought us up to the $200 million MDF amount. Uh, working within the resources that was currently appropriated from the last legislative session. Uh, so as you can see, based upon the $612 million that we are tracking right now, 
uh, the current shortfall in the major disaster fund is approximately 612 uh, or $412 million. Uh, we are making a proposal. So we still have uh, a some restrictions that we can withhold and not release to departments. And we are proposing to withhold approximately $62 million worth of restrictions right now. And that we can bring that number down for the ask of 300. Okay, so the 62 million and then you're 116, so 200 million. So 200 million dollars has been taken out from departments in order to cover shortfalls within, okay, in, so, in order to shore up the major disaster fund. So when we sent out the memo asking for cuts, they're already doing that basically. They can't cut, they can only restrict. We can't restrict, we can only cut, but it's trying to achieve the same thing, yes. a balanced budget. So when people, when people are saying, hey, why are we asking for cuts? Well, internally, they're already doing that. Chair, question. So, um, Lois, so when you 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 made this cuts, one hundred sixty four million adjustment, when was that? Uh, that was done in the aftermath of disaster when we originally infused the major disaster fund. I believe that was in September. Okay. So, is, are the departments now coming in and asking us for all this money, extra monies now since you've cut? Is that what's happening? Maybe. I. I would defer to the departments in terms of what their motivation is for asking this, but you know we have a plan that was originally submitted, and we're asking the departments to stick to the original plan that was submitted and not ask for anything more than what was already uh, that has already gone through the process. Okay, of but you know there's bills and stuff that they've gone to legislators and asked to be introduced yes. and so forth. So and, over and above. And I will be sending out a memo to the departments, letting them know that they should not be asking for anything more than what's currently in the authorized uh, budget that was approved by the governor. Um, and does this include UH as well, the restrictions? Uh, there was a portion of money that we did take from UH, yes. What was that portion? Uh, I do not have the details of which, but I can get that to you, okay. Senator. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, so we are looking at uh, an infusion, oh, well, uh, total amount right now for the EA for the major disaster fund. And, and if I can also, highlight whatever is not used. I mean, we are planning for the a, a scenario based upon all obligations that have been made so far. Sure. Understanding that if those obligations are released, it's what we could do is we could carry over those that we could carry over those funds in the major disaster fund into year two because we know that this is going to be a multi-year uh, a so, multi -year that, so you're saying if we end up approving the emergency approval? Yes, if then, you end up um, approving the emergency approval. And let's just say, again, with the condo issue, if we know that or if the once I get confirmation that the $40 million will be moving over from... You're just going to use the money for next year. We'll just use the money. It'll just carry over into next year's... Uh, yeah, it's all even in the wash anyway. It'll, it'll wash anyway, yes. So... If you look at what we are currently proposing for the major disaster fund, uh, as well as the $65 million that we are proposing for the one Ohana fund, our ending balance for our FY24 drops from $1 billion uh, to $604 million. Mm -hmm. So it's approximately a, a, a little over a $400 million yeah. loss to the financial plan in the fiscal year. Okay, but it's, it's after 25, that's... But the, the issue becomes after 25. So at, uh, in 25, we also still have a Council on Revenues meeting that's going to happen on March 11th. Uh, you know, again, not really sure, but given the news, we're taking, we're being very cautious with regards to what the what that projection would be because that would ultimately impact our total revenue amount depending on where, you know, if they were to go down given certain circumstances. Uh, again, and that would continue to whittle away down that $600 million carryover balance. In FY25, based upon the budget that we proposed to you, which is included in, in, this, in the expenditure portion of what we're asking for, we originally projected that we would still end up the year before the disaster of having about a billion dollar carryover. Uh, granted, that has changed significantly because we know that the carryover is now only $600 million. But if you were to add on, there is a governor's message that will be coming down next week. And this is to cover just immediate expenses for 
uh, to address issues associated with health as well as our insurance premiums. So there's nothing that's being requested in the GM right now uh, that is not. And how much is that? It's $69 million mm -hmm. for, uh, for the next GM. Uh, if you were to include that additional $69 million, as well as a number that we, and this is probably the first time we we're putting it publicly, but at least a number that we are currently setting aside for pay for the temporary hazard pay of about $300 million, our ending balance now drops to $281 million. Yeah, so if it wasn't for the carryover, we're in the red. Yes. And again, these are based upon very... Okay, and what's the what's the, what's the 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 amount we should be at for carryover balance so that it doesn't affect our bond rating? So we have a current policy that was established in the previous administration that we would like to have approximately 20% in both carryover and Hard reserves, yeah. uh, includes, 20% of general fund. Yeah, that includes hurricane relief and rainy day. And rainy day. So if you look at the bottom here, the hurricane uh, or the EBRF is about $1.5 billion. And we have $170 million in the hurricane relief fund. Uh, I caution though, because there are bills that are moving through the legislature right now that could change the disposition of the hurricane relief fund. I know we've used that in the past, but there are certain circumstances that maybe the hurricane relief fund will be will be reconstituted into a into an insurance mitigation type fund. So from a planning purposes, if I were to just look, if I were to remove the hurricane relief fund from a from a reserve category, uh, we have about $1.5 billion worth of hard reserves right now, which Roughly sure. translates to about 15%. Yeah, which is um, five, 500 million short. Which is $500 million short, but taking into account the carryover balance. So if we, you know, I've been consistently talking about this issue of a structural balance of the financial plan. And that meant keeping about, keeping 15% of general fund reserves in the EBRF and having approximately $500 million in carryover balance that would that the state would be able to flex with regards to changes in the council on revenues projection. And so right now uh, we are only half of, well, we'll approximately half of what we would be comfortable with in terms of a carryover balance at the end of fiscal year 25. Okay, so the administration also had a package of bills. Yes. Are those? Those are included in the plan right now, yes. Including the? It includes the tax credit. It includes the gap plan. And those are those are in the top line portion. And we can get you the details of it in terms of specific requests that are being asked for uh around again in the original budget. But this financial plan covers sheltering for how long? This financial plan covers sheltering through June of 2025. Okay. Yes. So every month after June, we reduce that amount by 30 million. Every month. We would be diving into what we have in the major disaster fund because we do also have an ask in FY25 for an additional 100 and I believe $180 million worth of infusion into the major disaster fund, which would bring the total amount of the major disaster fund to approximately, uh, yeah, say close to $800 million worth. Okay, so you can cover sheltering for how many more months after June? I want to say none because we yeah, know but, we but, have other expenses that are going to be coming in. Okay, so the 180 was anticipated. What cost then? How did you come up with the 180? The 180 was projected on other types of expenses. Such so as not the sheltering. It, the sheltering was always included in the in the original 200 million that we set, okay. set aside for because our original estimate of. So I don't want you to say that. Oh, but we have the 180. Yeah, because yeah. we. But if you have it budgeted for other things and sheltering, then you really don't have... Then we really... I understand what you're saying. Yes. Uh, so what we are budgeting for right now is for sheltering through the end of fiscal year 24, which would be June 30, 2024. So it's, I go back to then anything in sheltering after that is eating into something. Correct. Yes. So that goes by, that's why we need the housing plan. So if the housing plan shows that sheltering is still required after June, then this is... A little bit off. Mm -hmm. the, we are highly dependent upon executing uh, the housing plan and moving people out of non-congregate sheltering. Sure. Okay. 
Any other questions? So now we can hear from the, you know, the Count Luke and uh, Josiah. I, I think you guys are the coaches of the task force, right? <laughs> Hey, this hey, informal there, task force, I suppose. Is there any other questions that I can? No, we can come back to you. I think a lot depends. So you, at, that, at least everybody can see where this is at. Yes. So I, why we need, why, how we're at this situation, how it affects the budget without the housing plan in place and people housed by June, it's going to affect having to make some cuts. Thank you, Chair. Okay. I'll be, I'll stand by for anybody. Because you you still haven't you still haven't asked the departments to pull back their bills. Like I said, the other day but we other had... than bills that were originally part of the admin package, if there are other bills that were not part of the admin package, departments should not be asking for that at this point. Okay, but if they if they rather give up their bill instead of the restriction or cuts, I mean they got to decide because it sounds like. They would want. They're still wanting it all. Yes, I would want them to come and approach me on that, so that I can factor in what they're thinking with regards to what their departmental operating expenses are going to be going forward. So, okay. Can I just follow up? So does that mean that they're not going to come in and testify in favor of all these bills? Um, because even though you tell them pull them back, they're still coming in and testifying in favor of bills that legislators have had possibly introduced on because they were requested. We, we need to have that discussion as an administration. Yeah, Senate. he's saying above his pay grade. <laughs> but okay. we're already going through our own committee no. cuts. Yeah. It, so it doesn't matter whether it's a government's no, but they can, they, can, yeah, they can decide, yes. right? If they can help, they can help us decide. I rather I think the bill is more important, and I'll make cuts in my department because I want this bill. Yes, and, and I mean they can decide again. If I can just emphasize, you know. We continue to push for higher levels of reimbursement from the federal government, uh, and we're very cognizant of how bills, because in addition to all of this, these are obligations, right? We also have the cash component of when cash actually goes out. So that's why part of the EA, well, a significant need for the EA is to make sure that we make those obligations and we account for those obligations in the year that it is incurred. Then that should have been part of the governor's message. As as the okay. variability of the plan. Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. thank you. Can, oh, excuse me, one more thing, uh, Lois. Can you make sure that all the departments get that information, including UH, about testifying? I'm they're watching this uh, hearing as we said. Well, but just as because they watch it doesn't necessarily mean it sinks in. Um, or lobbying to have certain bills heard that, that they shouldn't be, you know, so. We're at a deadline already, so it doesn't make yeah. sense. Oh, when it cross over, oh, it's oh actually... when they cross over, there's bills on the oh, house yeah, side. House side. I, I guess when we have a caucus, we can decide which bills are going to get recommitted based on this conversation. And and the governor's been extremely. Uh, I mean, the governor knows what the what we submitted in the governor's package, uh, and any other bills above the governor's package, uh, you know, that hasn't that hasn't. No, but the 65, we can get into this later on, but the 65 million that you're asking for the one Ohana fund that you guys want to include in the governor's message, right? When was that originally announced? The one Ohana fund? Yeah. Um, I don't remember the exact date. I have to- Sometime in the fall? A turn. Okay, what season then? Was it sometime in the fall? <laughs> but, but they have announced it. I need to, I need- November, I need. okay, it was announced in November. So, Okay, but there wasn't even any kind of bill for the one Ohana fund in the administrative package. That is correct. So the committee, even if you, if you didn't have the, the dollar amounts, I'm not sure when the dollar amounts were all agreed to, there wasn't even a bill with a blank amount. So that knowing, signifying to us, we need to fill in the blank. So we're only having discussion this discussion on the one Ohana fund within the last week when it should have started back when we had info briefings. Because part of the, the budget tables that get sent to the departments are what are the bills that you have that have money. And that hasn't been, that one Ohana fund was not part of any budget table. The, there was no bill in part of the administrative package. 
Understood, Chair. And despite our concerns, it's still being announced and still going forward. <laughs> and we haven't had time to vet it. So if we if it was done to the proper procedure, where we, we could have had January and February to have real discussions about it. But now we're short, we're being asked to include it in the emergency appropriate. Tonight's the filing deadline. I, I don't know. I don't think that's fair to the to the legislature. I understand. I understand. Yeah. Okay, why don't we hear from um, the housing task force? Okay, the, this is, if we can just cut to the chase and show us the plan and what the deadlines are so that we can get people housed. I mean, just kind of get to that point. And then at least we get that over with. Because if people have questions about specific projects, then we can get into that. Because we have less than an hour and we still have the emergency appropriation bill. Uh, Chair, Vice Chair. Good morning. Uh, committee members, Major General Ken Hara, Adjutant General State of Hawaii, Department of Defense, and the Director of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Did you want me to just cover some of the questions that you had for budget and finance, though, about the, the housing plan and why, how we got stuck? No, we, can, we can do that after. Exactly. I just don't want to run out of time because okay. I want to just show people that, I don't, this is the first time I'm seeing this too, but I just want to show people that you guys have a plan and what the deadlines are to get everybody housed, because okay. then we know how that's going to affect the financial plan. And this, this presentation will show that. So. Yeah. And then we can ask, I turn then you can go back to sure. the questions you want to ask. I just want to thank everybody that helped yeah. to put this together, right? So the, you know, the governor's team led by Luke Myers, Maui team, Josiah and, and Keanu and um, Wendy and nonprofits and everybody. And the, the um, Department of Human Services, phenomenal work. So um, Luke, I'll turn it over to you to kind of just champion this and see how the other introductions and then get into the, the meat of the briefing. Yes, sir. Thanks. We just bring up this briefing first. Uh, just do the initials of enough. Is that anyone else? That's fine. Thank you. Uh, thanks for allowing us to be here today. Uh, Josiah Nishita, Managing Director with the County of Maui. I'll just keep it really brief. Um, I, we did provide some handouts regarding the County of Maui's uh, funding request for infrastructure improvements that would assist both the repopulation efforts and permanent and temporary housing uh, coming up within uh, the West Maui area uh, for our survivors. So we can get into the meat of it uh, as, as we head into the, the meeting and uh, some question and answer period, but I just wanted to provide that information to the committee. Thank you. Okay. Real, quick, real quick though. So did the, did the budget team review Mari's request, because if you have, have, has the governor decided which of this he's going to also try to support and include in the governor's message? I, I, no. Other than that, I'm not the oh, Okay. Other than the original request. Because that shows some alignment that if the governor supports at least parts of these things, then we can anticipate it in the financial plan. Well, the governor has the original request, right? Yeah. It was a letter. It yeah. was a letter that was sent. Yeah, so the governor has a letter. What he told us is we're going to meet again um, tomorrow when he returns to discuss Maui's request. Okay. So he, he's um, traveling right now. And then that'll be in a form of a governor's message? I believe so. And then we should be able to have the numbers that you're looking at from budget and finance. Okay. Okay. Uh, Luke Myers, State Disaster uh, Recovery Coordinator Office of the Gov. State side of the uh, Joint Health Task Force, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to respond to uh, the housing strategy that we've been working on and provide some information. Okay. Next slide, or I can go. General, you guys want to switch? Okay. Just some key takeaways here. Um, we want to stress that there is a there has been an ongoing unified effort between the county, the state, the federal, and private partners since the incident started with a focus on housing. Okay, you know what? I don't mean to to cut you sh short, but I just want to get to the end first, and then we can do this. Just because if we run out of time, I want to get to the main point of what's really the housing plan and what's the timeline on it. Then we can go back to all of this. I'm, I'm okay with it. I just want to get, because we don't have that much time. Okay. Just some clarification. Uh, 
the state and the county agreed that about 4,000 housing units are needed. And there was some discrepancy in the last meeting, so I want to reinforce that point. Uh, in the housing strategy document that, that was provided uh, to you all as a copy, the housing strategy is broken up into three phases. There is a sheltering phase, there is an interim phase, and a permanent phase. To see all this incident, we're still in the interim phase, which is the non congruent shelter. Uh, there are a number of resources that um, have been discussed from a budgetary perspective, including the non congruent sheltering. Uh, and from the state side, that has been uh, led by no. uh, the Department of Defense and Mike Nemo with Red Cross. So we're still in phase one, not phase two. It's it's great. They they, they carry over. Uh, each survivor, each household has their own story okay. in transition. And okay, so you should have NCSC interim too then, because that's not on there. It, it overlaps, yeah. So these are just some general graphics that, that okay. show where we are. Uh, we, we, our goal is obviously to have NCS end so we can move those survivors. Yeah, because we're, we're we're past the six months. So then, I'm just pointing out that there's no NCS in that. That's correct. Okay, that was our you know with any plan, uh, we we do have goals and deliverables, and that was the goal was to be able to move those survivors out after any six months, and we're actively working it. Uh, there are a number of solution sets that are identified for the interim, which uh, tied to this uh, budget hearing. Uh, on the state and county side, and we'll walk through a little of those. And then there are permanent housing solutions that as we get into 2025 and 26, which are uh, important as we plan out uh, in future years. Next slide. So I'm gonna, the way we're gonna kind of break up this presentation, uh, Mid General is gonna walk through where we are at phase one with NCS. Uh, there's a slide that's presented in here, and I believe there's a couple more slides general that, that you wanna walk through on where we are cost-wise and number-wise with the NCS sheltering. Sir, do you want to walk through um, the sheltering? We can because this is what's yes. costing us the most yes, money. Sir. So, but I still want to get to the point what how shelter, how we transition from sheltering yes. housing, what the timeline. So on the NCS um, task force with FEMA, Red Cross, and Department of Human Services, you can see on the left, the, the FEMA solution set. FEMA will take care of them. We're not worried about that. It's the um, 659, and that's the number that Lewis mentioned constantly flux. We're in flux with yeah, that number. It was 820 the last time. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. And we constantly um, will engage with FEMA to get better fidelity on that number. Last week, uh, the number that I was confident the state was on the hook for was 29. This week, we're at 11, that the state says we're funding these people. Other than that, we're, everything else is still in flux. What what this task force does- This is what FEMA is saying are the numbers, but your number is 11. Yes, sir. So there's a discrepancy. Okay, so you have to continue to negotiate to get that to ele closer to 11. Exactly. Yes, sir. What, what this team does too, this task force will provide the needs uh, identified by those in the state county category as far as the, the housing solution sets. FEMA has a list of what they need on, on their side for direct lease, and the state has a, here's the, you know, the inventory that we're looking for. And we were in constant um, communication with the, the housing task force and uh, DHS for the interim. Thank you. Do you have no. additional slide for NCS that you wanted to share? No, we'll give them the data. So just go back to the interim slide, uh, sir. So there's a coordinated effort between the, the non congress sheltering uh, task force and the joint housing task force uh, to work with the survivors. Our goal is to provide them safe, secure, and sanitary, and stable housing options. You will have a, uh, in the back of your packet, there There are there's uh, two additional attachments and it includes uh, a list of housing solutions. Uh, this is a snapshot, uh, I would say interim housing solutions uh, that have been looked at in geographic areas uh, and by various partners. To move the survivors out of NCS, uh, IEMA and partners have been working uh, to match those survivors with housing units. Uh, there have been uh, two match programs set up on Saturdays to engage the survivors. Uh, that 650 number that 
Administrator Barros mentioned, to try to connect them with housing solutions uh, to move them on. Uh, as we look at housing solutions on the interim side that would have implications on the state budget, there are several state programs uh, that have been discussed uh, last week, and I'll, I'll reference them on the table here. Uh, one is the DHS Rental Assistance Program, which has a capacity potentially of about 300 households. Uh, and the other is a build at the, uh, the lay lead site that HHFDC maintains of about 450 households. So th there has been uh, discussions in the previous uh, hearings on the state investing in those two solution sets uh, to help bring down the cost of where we are with survivors in NCS as we project out uh, into uh, the fiscal year. Uh, 2020. Can, you, can you just go back to the, yeah. So that's 659. So I see here, um, let's take for instance, housing, South Maui, Hagai, 175, March 28. So that means we can take possibly 175 people by the end of March from that list, from the red box into, and reduce that number. Yes, Chair. And, and this is just individuals that are in NCS. So not every survivor is sitting in NCS. So that's loop and- uh, Yeah, but the goal is to get yeah. as many people out of NCS. Yes, yes. So that's yeah, where so I, for members, just look at the timeline of when time units, time units are available or estimated completion date. That's where you can tell if we're gonna be able to meet uh, the BNF's deadline of having to get everybody housed by the end of June. So if it goes beyond June, that number is in flux, but we have to determine what that is. So it could go really low or it could still be problematic. So just kind of watch that. So it's a estimated completion date and time units are available. Match that up with how many people are in shelter. And to reiterate your point, Chair, the, the top priority is to get people out of the non-congregate shelter yeah. into the hall. So that's where when it says things like, fiscal year 25 um, or fiscal year 27, fiscal year 29. That's not going to help mm -hmm. us. Right. The ones that's going to help us are going to be um, before July 24, because that meets the BNF's deadline um, or budget plan. Uh, so, so programmatically, uh, to your point, Chair, the, uh, the state and the, the county and partners are looking at what programs to move those survivors out of NCS. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, the state initiatives, uh, we are working very closely uh, with the Color Emergency Management Agency on their direct lease program, their rental assistance program, and their temporary bills. Yeah. So that's, if you look there, that's the, the bottom two. Yes. So direct lease FEMA is paying for, with, for both. Yes, there, there is no state and rental assistance. cost share for those, so that is on the federal government. But th there Not is even the 10%. There's no, okay. there's no problem. But there is a planning assumption, though, that those survivors accept that, ex that, that assistance. If a survivor uh, has dependencies in West Maui, whether it's a job, whether it's children, uh, they reserve the right to turn down an offer of assistance uh, to the federal government or other areas. So um, this has been a, this has been a, um, a, an important planning requirement for us as in various teams to support the survivors. Uh, but there, there is an assumption that the survivor will accept the assistance on that side. If those survivors do not accept the federal assistance, they may become the responsibility on the state side for General Harbor, Major Barros, the county, and, uh, and myself. So, okay, so does that mean if there's a housing unit available, they can at least go to that? that is but if, there's, if not, that means we're covering them 100% in sheltering. We would start to plan to accommodate them, yes, sir. Chair, after I, I spoke to the governor, we're going to take each case case by case. So it's not automatic that the state will inherit those that um, decline the federal assistance. Okay, so are you going to have a policy document that you can share? Yes, sir. So again, I'm meeting with the governor and the whole team again on Friday. Is it required that we have to? No. Provide? Okay. No, by sure. Okay, but you know, as, as long as we have something to offer, that's the main right. thing. And again, you know, to um, Senator McKelvey's point during the last information briefing, we're, we've got to be compassionate, right? So if we look at it and it was like, hey, you, we're providing you a home near the school, 
and near your work, and yet you turn it down, more than likely the state will not pick them up, yeah. as an example. But then, hey, you're putting, me, you're putting yeah. me in central Maui. My kid's school is here. So again, every, everything's going to be case by case. Can I just go question? Sorry, real fast. What about the units? And I, I keep hearing it. And I don't, there's a lot of units in West Maui now that are under FEMA contract that are pay, being paid for that are empty, sitting empty. A lot of people are stuck in the background check process and they're in limbo. While you're in background check, you're in the non congregate shelter. Yeah, but in that case, though, well, we're still covering the 10%. Yeah, and right. that's right. In West Maui, people want to be. FEMA's covering the 100%. 100% yeah. direct federal but as it's Except the NCS component, we're paying the 10%. For 10%, but the, um, the caveat to that is the president signed, they're giving the state 90 days within the first six months of the disaster at 100%. So we are still working with FEMA trying to determine when the window should be for the 90 days. I'm trying to look at, you know, build that bell curve when we spend the most amount of money to determine when we're going to take advantage of the 100%. The same is true for, so that's um, category B um, emergency uh, services. The other one is category A, which is the degree clearance. They're going to give us 100% for six months. And that also the state in coordination with FEMA will determine when we're going to set the 100% federal cost share. Okay. So that'll, that'll bring the numbers down. The problem is we cannot anticipate or estimate um, how much savings we'll get from the 100% cost share. Okay, but those who fail their background check or have difficulty with it, they can have access to the FEMA units, right? I don't know that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's temporary to go yeah that's about 160 units now. Yeah. And then when does that, when is that up? Estimating the, the, the third quarter, is, is that the same uh, Leili property that um, the FEMA? Can, no, the FEMA one. It is also at Leili right now. Yeah, yeah. No, what's the what's the timeline for that to be up? Potentially in July third quarter, sir. July first. Uh, estimate of July right now is all that we've been given, uh, depending on. Okay, because uh, in that in that situation, we continue to cover unless you get your thing, right. the ten percent until we can get them into the FEMA shelter. Or into one of these other programs. Yes, sir. And, and okay. Just to, uh, to the centers, there's about 256 households that have been placed in the record. So mm -hmm. um, their team is actively working to connect those available units to those survivors, uh, trying to work through those items. In I mean, there should be zero units within the West Maui because all of them <clears throat> have been placed already. That's the point. I mean, to go beyond the numbers. It's a fact that there are units available to right there, you know, and yet it's the going through the whole process of the broker and the background check and everything, and they're sitting empty. Yeah, and, but we tried to get FEMA here. Our understanding is FEMA, um, I guess, asked the governor's office if it was appropriate for, the, for them to come. And I think um, the governor's office said, oh, Haima has it covered. So, I mean, we can try to invite FEMA again to an, a future briefing, but I guess Haima would have to agree that FEMA has, could be here. Yep, yeah, but so, that's inventory to people as quick as possible. I think right. But then, yeah. well, yeah. but relatively speaking, that's the smaller cost. Yeah, but the, yeah. the challenge we saw is because I, I spoke to um, <clears throat> Department of Homeland, I mean, uh, Human Services, the the amount that FEMA is offering, I, I think it's uh, 360 Yeah, three hundred sixty percent above the fair market rate. And that's way above what you know we'd like to pay. Remember, the governor said that seven thousand yeah. to uh, yeah. it was like fourteen thousand. Yeah, um, that's that's what we're trying to to well, negotiate. It's impacted the FEMA rental assistance program because they hyperinflated the market by three hundred percent. People can't go try to go rental assistance route. They can't qualify with what's given out. No, based well, on we that. we can go back to this, but I yeah. think we should figure out how we're going to get the red block housed yeah. because that's the larger dollar amount right now. But what I wanted to point out during my intro is the biggest challenge we had is one is we didn't have the inventory that we thought we could get through rentals. Then we didn't have the inventory because of some of the delays um, that the uh, human services project had. And then so coming up to the cliff for the American Red Cross contract, and we didn't want to displace about 4,000 people 
you know, overnight without a plan. So that's when the governor said, hey, you, we're at the cliff. We don't have any other alternatives. So it wasn't a conscious decision to go over budget. It was in um, with the approval of the governor and then working with budget and finance, trying to figure out how we're going to fix that problem. And and worst case was we okay. just need to tax each of the departments and then the best case, hoping that we get some emergency appropriation. It's just, we just ran out of time. Just everything was going wrong because it's moving so fast. Senator Dekoy. So, so when we look at the state uh, housing, in this case, Hagai, and you guys start to place, is there a requirement on whether or not they deny it? Um, so if they deny it to go into the red box. So you're, 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 so you're saying that when they deny the state's assistance, yeah. it's not the field case. Yeah. Right. So what and that, that's the discussion we're having tomorrow. So I, I brought it up folks. with the governor. He was thinking in his mind, he had some ideas, but he said, hey, let me get back from this trip and we'll, we'll gather all the subject matter experts and set a policy for the state. So in his mind, he does have a plan. And there, there is a possibility that um, the state may deny assistance to those that have denied the federal assistance. And in assistance. your mind, do you have a plan? I do, but I, I just make a recommendation, <laughs> right? It's just an idea until the governor says yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so why don't we get to the point where we can talk about the ineligible getting housed by the end of June? Is that possible? So we, we have solution sets that... Uh, have been provided, uh, we talked about the match days and trying to, and FEMA has participated in those with partners uh, to move those individuals and connect them to their housing solutions. Uh, the state program, and I think we have DHS, uh, Chris Spear, to come up and talk about the rental assistance yeah, program. Just going back to my question, does this plan that you have allow everyone that's ineligible to be housed by the end of June? The rental assistance program is looking at about 300 households. So based on these numbers, um, so we have about half of those covered uh, through the rental assistance program. Uh, if uh, additional funds were allocated, more households could potentially accommodate through that route. Our secondary alternative, which puts us to the right of, of June, is the build at Leili'i, which is about 450 households. So. In some, and when is Lee Lee supposed to be? It would be sometime in the, uh, the third quarter of this year. We could bring up state DHS. So, so just give me a month. July, end of July, probably. Okay, so that would be one more month of us paying NCS. Yes. Sure. Question. That's not anticipated right now in the budget. We are actively working to, to have that as soon as possible, but you understand the, the requirements over there. Question. So I'm hearing that some of these people are saying that they rather live in trailers or in tents on the beach. So are you folks addressing any of that? Yeah, each survivor has to make a decision of whether they accept assistance from the federal government or the state or the county. Um, and through the disaster case management process, uh, those type of needs will come up. So we are trying to provide them housing solutions that would meet their needs. Okay, when you say meet their needs, though, I mean, instead of they don't want to be in the hotel, so are they being provided with an option with trailers or something that's less costly than being in a hotel? Yes, they would be provided. So if, if they were part of the, the red block. Up no, there, but you don't have an area to, to say, if you don't want the hotel, we don't have a house right now, but you want to, you, here's a tent city that you guys, if you want to, that's... We haven't given them those options, right? My understanding is Red Cross will give you a tent and then it's up to you. Yeah, there is no <laughs> tent solution being provided at us, the county, if they've identified any. Well, that's the question I'm asking. Is a tent uh, solution and a trailer solution being provided? Because I know in other other states, those are the options that was provided. We are providing safe, secure, and stable housing solutions. The rental assistance. That's not my question. My question is: Are we doing what they've done, what FEMA has done in other states, by offering trailers and tents? Modular units are being offered. It is no. Why no, can't you say no? You don't even make the meeting go longer. Just say, if, if there's no tent and no trailer, just say no. No, Senator. Okay. Well, why? Why aren't we? One is the, the trailers are extremely costly. 
Uh, is it more costly than a thousand dollars a day for a hotel? It's in the policy thing, but not just that, that's not what I'm asking. Is it more costly? I don't know. Well, you guys don't, don't think? Know. You guys don't look at all the possibilities. So, and is there a place to place them in terms of you know a safe place? Right. Well, why wouldn't we be exhausting all the possibilities? It's not like we're creating this new. They've used it in other states, and it's worked. I have no. In the same way, if you're taking a tent from Red Cross now and going to the beach, then why wouldn't we at least provide a safer environment with showers and and things like that? Because my understanding is that's what Red Red Cross actually tries to get them off the list. And so we, we will explore some of those other options that, that have been done. Um, we have thoroughly discussed with yeah. FEMA based on prior disasters of uh, trailers being brought in specifically by FEMA. If, and yeah. Cost well, if they're going to choose it as an option, it should be something that at least is safe, that right? they have access to showers and water. There was a decision made by the governor earlier in the event not to bring in trailers. No, I understand that. Yeah, why? Like, that's a concern. No, wait, why? At one time, we primarily took the cost of logistics. Yeah. Oh, right. One highway in and out. Do you oh, have that? Do you, you have, have inventory, inventory right there? It's an inventory. Wait, wait, wait. All right. No, so the question is he said that the, it was a decision by the governor to not bring in trailers because of the costs. Okay, so do you have. The documentation of what the cost and logistics are so that we can provide that to the committee. We can get that. I do not have that today. Okay. And sure, we'll, we'll bring it up with the governor again tomorrow. Okay. I mean, I'm just saying if that's some if that's an option that the survivor would like temporarily, then you might as well make it safe. Right. Does the county, um, Josiah, Josiah, does the county have some land that's safe that at least temporarily get them off? The beaches, because I'm, I'm hearing that the beaches are also, people are being, you know, on the beaches unhealthily. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's essentially the essence of the county's program is repopulation efforts to uh, areas that have been cleared. So we already have 200 property, over 200 properties have been cleared, probably 200 to 300 per month infrastructure restoration and the county's housing program, which we're going to be requesting funding from our county council for, which we've already gotten uh, $8 million, excuse me, $8 million recently for our ADU program, uh, specifically to do that, to place it on uh, properties that have been cleared um, to rehouse survivors. And uh, we're going to be requesting an additional $75 million uh, for that housing program. From the county. From the county. Okay, so that's their skin in the game kind of thing. You guys are showing that there's the $400 million ask from the state, you're still doing a lot of asks for yourselves. Yes. Um, and just to be clear, uh, regarding that $400 million request that was spread out over three years, it, it, I apologize if that wasn't clear previously, spread out over three years, $78 million of that was not specifically coming to the county. It was a recommendation um, to partner in repopulation efforts um, that the state could or could not participate in, uh, but the county is moving forward with our own program, about $83 million uh, for that effort, uh, in addition to the infrastructure requests that would help make that possible by returning utilities to those properties. Okay, so I just wanna get to the main thing again. The Lea Lee pro project is gonna be past June. So if there's an estimated date, we need to know how much that's gonna end up costing because um, that's gonna affect the, sec the second fiscal year, like 25. What other projects are going to be beyond July 1st? Rental assistance program. Uh, no, no, I mean available, not up and running. You know, when the units are going to be available or estimated completion date. Yeah, so those, those are the two state programs that, that we are primarily looking at for that ineligible group. Sir. Only the RAP and Leali. Those are the two state investments that for the, the current budget that we are looking at. So not Haggai? Uh, Haggai's costs, I um, have to defer to like, the finance director. Those are already included. That is an option that, that could be, uh, uh, that is being looked at to move those survivors. Okay, let me ask it a different way then. Yeah. How many of the ineligible will not have access to RAP or a housing facility past July 1st? 
how many people are still going to be in NCS? What we'll is that number you do not know based on their business? Did you have an estimate, a guess? Based on the numbers that you showed us with the housing and the rap money available, how it has to be some kind of calculation. If I if I use a number that is up there, uh, minus the rap program and a guy, maybe it's about 150 households. Okay, so that's still 150 times thousand a day. Okay, so that'd be 150 thousand a day versus a million. Okay. So we just have to figure out working with BNF how long that would be because that starts eating into department's budgets. Yeah, the question on this side. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, so, uh, so. Go ahead. Slides. Go yeah. forward. Slides. Can we move forward? Good. So phase three is the primary option, and um, uh, this is where the you know, partnership uh, with the company. There are a number of longer term solution sets that obviously uh, there may be investment requests uh, for close to year 25, and more importantly for the next biennium, we start to look at uh, CIP and other, um, you know, in partnership with the county, the repopulation development infrastructure to support uh, people returning to their homes. Uh, and the county can talk about that in their slides. Uh, we do have some state infrastructure that was impacted when you look at permanent housing units coming on board, including the White Public Housing Authority, mm -hmm. some of their units that were burned. Uh, HHFTC is also here today. They have a number of units that uh, in the area that could be uh, brought online as we go out in time for fiscal year 2026, 27. Yeah. On the FEMA side, uh, there is another form of assistance of the direct housing mission called permanent housing construction. But this is going back to when they get out of NCS, yes. they're in some interim, and then they're going to go into this. But this this doesn't affect our immediate budget. That is correct. Sir. So I just want to get that but out of the way. The HHFDC, like Front Street Apartments, <clears throat> if the Corps can coordinate cleaning with the county, they're ready to start rebuilding like right now. And that's 200 units, potentially 400 units they can bring on really quickly. If they, because they're also going to do the EGP and change side as well, which is under one common area. So that's, I guess, a good point insofar as that's units that can be brought online quickly with coordination from the core and the county, and their HHFDC is, is ready to go. So, so but I, you have that on this list. Yeah. So the, this, if you look at these two documents, this is, this is basically the two categories of interim and long term. And you can see from the dates here, so if we, as long as you follow the dates, then you can figure out how much money we're going to have to be spending in the long run. Mm -hmm. And then the numbers of people that are going to be covered by each project. But it sounds like they can move quicker than the dates that have been indicated if, you know, certain coordination can happen. That's the only reason. Why yeah, so we're, we may have to have a follow-up hearing if, you, if, if members want to, if they want to get into each project. And, but at this point, we just kind of kind of get a bigger picture of to where, where, where we're headed. I think at this point in time, uh, to maximize time here with the repopulation and redevelopment of infrastructure, to your point about current fiscal impacts, it may be an opportunity yeah. to turn it over to Josiah and talk about their ask for 25. Yeah. Um, sir, if I could do that. Yeah, so this is going back to what infrastructure is needed in the burn zone so that people can move back because you're clearing the area with EPA, you're fast tracking permitting. Yeah, and uh, there's some documentation in front of you. I know for shortage of time, I, I won't be long-winded. Um, there's about a hundred, <laughs> has about 130 million dollars. I think 130.95 of infrastructure requests in there, with an additional 20 million for the access control costs um, for the disaster impact area. There are uh, a couple of projects listed on there that are outside of the impact area. And I'll just note that those are in furtherance of either uh, group housing sites uh, for FEMA or uh, permanent uh, reconstruction of um, uh, permanent construction efforts for uh, different projects. So most of these either are providing infrastructure rebuilt in the burn zone or providing infrastructure to one of these housing projects. Yes, and the vast majority of these are actually within the impact area. Okay, you got questions? Is there any specific one you want to highlight? 
Um, I, I, I guess I, I, I guess the, the most important that the, needs funding. Well, the, the main pieces are, of course, like water, wastewater, um, returning those utility services so people can have habitable units yeah. um, on the property. And I just would note too that we're uh, preparing to stand up our uh, expedited permitting center um, in April. Uh, which would assist people in getting re-permitted back to their properties as quickly as possible. Okay, so this this is all the four hundred million right here. Uh, no, sir. That's year? that's for FY twenty five. Since uh, that's kind of our discussion today. Yeah. And how much? It, it, it includes uh, uh, some of the funding for uh, projects in FY twenty six and twenty seven. Just so you can see the breakdown. Um, but all we were coming to the state for was uh, for assistance to help us make it through the first three fiscal years until federal uh, PA assistance and like CDBG DR funding and other federal sources and grants uh, would become available. Okay, so just highlight to us which specific project or page you're asking for in this fiscal year. Okay, uh, if if we're all working off of this one, kind yeah. of like the individual yeah. Yeah. project sheets. Um, so the first one you'll see there is related to travel, tra I'm sorry, traffic signal replacement. Yeah. Um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. We just had a lot of damage to traffic yeah. signals. So that's this year. Yeah. Okay. So th there is some funding uh, in this year for that. You can see the breakdown. Uh, the yeah. next page uh, for Front street repairs, this is just regarding um, making areas passable and safe, essentially. Um, any of the public works, so like so this is road 25. requests. Yeah. For 20. Yes. Fiscal year 25. Yes. Okay, next. Um, continuing on, uh, the next page is dealing again with uh, other road and sidewalk repairs. Um, and then uh, a key component okay. is the verification of survey monument, and that includes funding in this fiscal And that's for fiscal year 25. Yeah. Well, there's also funding in FY26 that would be needed, but yes. Oh, okay. Can we, Chair, can I just ask a question with the discovery and the um, the disaster of the cleanup in, the, in Lahaina itself, where there were homeowners' properties? How soon can you have that area cleaned up so if it's cleaned up faster, the infrastructure is rebuilt and they're willing to start building their own homes, we can find a lot more will be probably relocating to back to their properties. So how fast? It seems like it's um, kind of interesting that you go into 2026 with regards to the cleanup areas. So if somebody no, has a property... No, part of it is going to have to be... Some of these people, unfortunately, are going to be in interim housing for a couple of years until the infrastructure. So, so, that's, so, so are we speeding up? What I'm trying to say is, are we speeding up the infrastructure for that particular area? Or they can't speed it up without money. So that's what he's asking for money. So it just depends. If they get the funding, there's a certain timeline. If they don't get the funding, it's a longer timeline. Yeah, and we feel the most cost-effective means is to get people back to their properties so, as opposed to other kinds of solutions. So you can see from here that under the photos, there's a small grid Excel sheet. So if you just look at that, so $3 million first sheet, $5 million second sheet, $7 million third sheet, then $2 million, $12 million, $8 million, and then the other projects, that one doesn't have... Then another eight million for the storm drainage, two point five for what is this expedited permitting system? This is the four hundred million. Of this is no the hundred fifty for yeah. the first year. Yeah. So if you just it's the four hundred million. Hundred fifty on the four hundred million. Yeah. You you'll look at it. If it says twenty five, that's the hundred fifty. But when you add it all up, that should be the close to the four three something now, right? Well, three. I think it's three twenty three minus three, the seventy eight for housing from the state. Yeah. yeah. So that's that. You can see how they broke it up. So you're waiting for the state to come up with providing the resources. Has the county considered doing a large bond vote in advance to speed up the infrastructure cleanup? Do a do a bond float first. You got immediate monies. You can start working on that and. You know, we know that the ask is still going to be there upon us on the state. Okay. Thank you uh, for the question. Your capacity is not to that amount. No, you have bonding capacity, right? Uh, yeah, so we, we do have bonding capacity. I, I think the the key here is um, uh, 
we are already undertaking efforts to restore infrastructure. So I think our estimate of total expenditures thus far has been about 82 to $90 million uh, this fiscal year. So we're not waiting for things to happen in July to do things now. So we're, we're already moving forward to restore things as much as possible. But of course, funding is needed. And uh, as you can imagine with the impact to one of our main economic engines there, uh, in Lahaina, um, we are uh, meeting with, uh, we just had a recent meeting with one of the bond rating agencies um, and anticipate uh, kind of a, a re-review of um, our, our bond rating at this point um, as to whether they will change their position or, or uh, stand firm as to their, uh, uh, the credit rating of the county. Okay. Does this affect any of the numbers that we talked about earlier in regards to the, the NCS? Um, well, just in terms of like interim housing solutions, so there 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 are built in like upgrades and whatnot that's needed here to support um, some of the interim housing solutions. And you have that one identified. Hey, we we can break. It's not essentially broken out here for you, but we can have that broken out for you. Because if if the, both of you can get a better handle, I guess working with Haima, how many people are going to be in NCS after June thirty? And for how long? That I think is the question because if BNF is already covering it up to June 30 in their budget financial plan, then we just need to know how many people are going to affect fiscal year 25. Yeah, Chair, we'll, we'll take care of that. And I, I just wanted to point out also um, the money that goes to like the public utilities, that's category F, um, will be reimbursed. So the, the thing is either the state or county would have to pay up front and then we submit for that 90% federal reimbursement. So we get monies back. Yeah, but you still got to balance this year's budget. Correct. Yeah, but some of these, some of the ones are in out years too, right? Yeah. But some of the, so you guys can tell us which which we have to pay for now, Correct. we'll get back later. Correct. But we still got to figure out, you know, this fiscal biennial. Yes, sir. Okay, any questions? Sure, sorry, if I, if I may just address uh, I think a, a comment from Senator McKelvey about uh, why not seek federal funding, I think for one or two of the projects he had mentioned. Um, that is the plan, but we do have to upfront the costs and then seek reimbursement. For the expedited permitting one? Yeah, yeah. including expedited permitting. Can I just add? Oh, sure. So just say real quick, okay. you know, the 38 mil for the Central Maui land, you know, that was announced yesterday. Well, what what is what do you think the the timing of that is? You you really need the full amount in fiscal year twenty five. That one's going to be a more complicated project, huh? Yeah. So I mean, we're we're under time constraints with our federal partners. Like they they can't essentially be here forever providing all this assistance. So our estimated timeline right now is for design and permitting to occur between essentially now through August of this year, construction to occur from August to January, 2025, to be operational estimated by about February, 2025. Um, and then hauling from the uh, temporary disposal site to the permanent disposal site to occur uh, throughout the rest of 2025. But you still need land acquisition, right? Yeah, and we did submit a uh, request to council for consideration of uh, eminent domain proceedings. Um, and uh, we did kind of work through the the process right now. I can't kind of disclose everything, but there are opportunities to to uh, utilize the land fairly quickly if needed. And uh, we are beginning design efforts already. And then this is not FEMA reimbursable, right? No, it's not FEMA reimbursable, but um, FEMA is able to pay a certain amount of like tipping fees essentially uh, to help pay back some of the costs, but it of course occurs over time and there's operational costs not built into this request. So, so at some point, cause a lot of these are FEMA reimbursable. So whatever the state gives at some point, we're going to have to figure out an agreement of when the FEMA funds come back, what is that share breakdown of who gets what back? Right. Yeah. And I, I think what we indicated at the last meeting from Senator Kim's, uh, comments, uh, the reason why we broke it down this way was, uh, based on that 90, 10 split in anticipation that, um, in each three to five years as uh, the public assistance starts rolling in, uh, that that could be pro provided back to the state uh, for the contributions that were made early on for the eligible projects. Um, and then last thing, when you are rebuilding infrastructure, is the plan once you're clearing out, 
are you coming in and prior prioritizing those areas where you cleared out or is so or is so is there an infrastructure plan that starts where the clearing starts or is going on i suppose yeah in in general yes i mean there's certain areas that are more difficult than others due to either damage or terrain or whatever the case is but in general yes and it's prioritizing residential areas um not, not necessarily commercial areas at this point as we will work to rehouse people yeah. and then you can put adus on some of them if, if necessary right yes okay. okay um just a suggestion to the county i suggest that you get a uh get the construction industry in doing a workshop probably it's going to take you guys a week uh and reason i'm at i'm saying this is because when hawaii county when we develop the hotels in Waikoloa, we didn't have enough construction companies and workers. Uh, this is a big project. And what happened was we had an influx of mainland construction companies coming in. So that depleted a lot of our housing. So there were construction workers living on the beach at Kauai High. It became a problem because it was such a beautiful place. The family started moving in and they were living on the beach. So on the county council at that time, we had to rebuild a section of housing only for them. Uh, but it created a really bad situation. So the construction industry soon has to get together with all of you folks, because when you look at the Justice State Project, HHFDC, I mean, with our with the minimum construction companies we have in the state it's not going to be able to do all of the work that i see in this massive cleanup and that's just a suggestion that you guys got to start looking at it because you folks have to find housing for the construction importing of construction workers you guys, and i think it should be done soon you have a plan for that yeah, we, we have talked with a variety of uh, industry associations and whatnot. Um, sorry, okay. In, in any case, um, uh, yes, that, that is a significant concern, especially considering while FEMA operations are ongoing, because uh, FEMA has such huge needs and huge projects that are going on that they kind of suck up all the resources in the room, so to say um of available like trucks and manpower and whatnot um so all that factors into why you know we look at like adu programs for repopulation efforts because we can access like modular housing and other things that are less construction intensive in the short term to allow further permanent repopulation efforts in the long term based on limited manpower and other well another thing you should consider on your rfps for project development if a construction company is coming in from out of state then perhaps part of your proposals uh, should be, perhaps you should consider doing your own housing. So the idea about bringing in modular housing yeah, or, or trailers, then put it on the responsibility of them on the properties they're going to develop. So I'm just kind of thinking future because you're going to have a big issue um, with with all of that, with construction. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Okay, so the sooner you can get a a dollar amount of how many people are going to be in NCS after July 1st or June 30th. Yeah. Any more any more questions on the housing yeah, component? Super fast, if I may. Um, yeah, just go ahead, real, quick. On, uh, real quickly, you got condos in the burn zone, Puamana, other places where if the infrastructure were to be located there first, you probably could get the owners to enroll them in the housing program at much lesser rates to take up the NCS people. So I just throw that out there real quickly because it's low hanging fruit. Thank you. Okay. And, you know, we don't have time, unfortunately, to go into all the different projects and then including the, the wrap. But this is this is a document that DHS provided some brief information about rental assistance program. And later on, we can kind of get into it. But for now, we just have to figure out how this is going to affect really the emergency appropriation as. Okay, thank you. BNF. Yeah, hi, Lewis. Uh, Morning, Senator. Thank you to the committee for letting me ask a question. Um, my understanding was, so I want to make sure we're correct here is that unless some of these cost containment measures in this plan are undertaken immediately, 
uh, with costs uh, with costs being incurred daily as they are, am I correct in the understanding that if it continues in this way, um, that the state cash balance cannot uh, we cannot remain uh, in the positive in our cash balance through the summer? Uh, are you talking to summer the summer of 2024? Was, my understanding was that if costs continue at the rate they are proceeding right now on a daily basis, that we will have exhausted our state carryover balance by July 1. Um, no, not necessarily, um, Senator. I think uh, if you're talking about Ju uh, June 2024 versus June 20 July 1, 2024, the balance is zero if we continue to spend on a daily no. basis at the rate we are today. No, it goes down from 1 billion carryover. Down yeah, to so, so the carryover as it stands that it, in the fiscal year that would end on June 30, 2024, based upon everything that we're putting into the plan right now, there would still be a carryover balance of approximately $600 million, uh, of which if there is no cost containment going forward, we would continue to eat into the ending balance, which would impact the the ending balance of fiscal year twenty five, which would be the which would be June twenty twenty five. That's where we get to a very precarious position. Yeah, and so so I did get that wrong. It's not it's not this current fiscal year. It's not this current fiscal that year. we're in a budget crisis. Yeah. It's in the second fiscal year. Yeah, when I, when I. When I when we had uh, the original discussion uh, the other week, uh, it was always about getting out of the biennium and finishing out 2025 with a carryover balance that would be appropriate and enough in order to address potential variability in our revenue projections based upon what the council on revenue does. Yeah, right. except in the sense where they don't have to. Uh, uh, definitive number of how much how many households are going to be in NCS after June 30 of this fiscal year which means it's going to impact fiscal 25. year 25 correct so that that's where that's get that's kind of scary that that's where the importance of the housing plan and again moving people out of non-congregate sheltering which is at this point in time our largest expenditure right so now. Worst, but worst case scenario his carryover balance now is at 280 281. So you figure how many months that is that we have if we're only going to pay for NCS, 30 million. Well, what's confusing to me, and maybe because I don't sit on WAM, is that the DOE came in and said that they're exhausting their existing funds right now, budgeted for other items for Maui response. And then uh, they are also preparing, six days ago, they told the Star Advertiser they're preparing for a 10% budget cut scenario that was, that was requested, I think, by this committee and the administration. That may include furloughs. And so I'm trying to understand what we are contemplating to, to balance out in the budget for this year that ends on June 30, 2024, and then what we need to account for in starting July 1, 2024 into 2025. The DOE, among other, other agencies, needs to plug the $53 million hole that they've spent so far by cutting some sort of spending that they had budgeted already, right? And then they need to account for a 10% budget cut in the next year. That Do I understand that correctly? That, that would be correct. So, no, but, but wait, the, the one six, you said earlier that 116 came from all departments, right? Correct, all departments. And, yes. But now it's, so 53 million of the 116 came from the DOE. I, I don't have the final accounting of what came from the DOE. From my understanding, the last MC1 report that we had had approximately about 30 million right. of, uh, so, of DOE expenses that were included. So one department covered almost one third the costs. That would be correct, yes. Wow. And, and I believe a lot of those expenses were related to um, supplies, cleaning, getting stuff ready for students to move. Uh, outside of the line. But area. they still had to cut from operations to pay for that. They took from existing operations and were making those expenditures 
going forward. They did put in a request on, uh, well, maybe Haima could answer it. They did put in a request for reimbursement from the major disaster fund. Uh, again, these are some of the reasons why we're asking for the infusion into the major disaster fund right now. But, but they, oh, go ahead. But they still have to contemplate a budget cut scenario in the second year. Yeah. And, you know, when... Well, it's either it's either the ledge figuring this out or you figuring it out, right? Because if we pass up what we consider a balanced budget on the information that you provide us... Correct. But yet this cost containment is out of control because your budget says June 30. But I, what we're hearing is NCS is going to go beyond June 30. And if it does, and we, we don't account for it in our budget then that means you're going to have to continue to restrict from Department C anyway. Mm. We would have to make provisions within the budget in order to make sure that the major disaster fund has enough money to pay for those expenses, correct? And, yeah. and if, if I may, because I'm going to say some things here that people might not want to hear, but this is very upsetting. The Department of Ag uh, the Department of Education six days ago told the Star Advertiser that they were contemplating furloughs in order to accommodate the 10% budget cut. So that's not even counting the 30 million that they've already spent that we have to figure out how to restore on top of the relief to the major disaster fund that is multiple X times what was budgeted you. when you folks came in in December for expenses that were being, that for expenses that were ongoing in December all the way until today. So for example, if we wait until April 1st to address the, the the components of this plan or if extraordinary action is taken on short-term rentals, that's still 60 days into the future. And that's 60 million more dollars that we're likely to incur. And it's gonna come out, there's, there needs, I feel like we're detached from reality in this conversation because that money is coming out of the DOE budget and everybody else. And so when did you folks know that this was out of control like this? And if we have the DOE contemplating furloughs, what kind of furloughs are we talking about? You know, I, there, 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 there seems to be a lack of urgency here. And I'm not talking about the people that are working out the details every day on the plan, but they're just, it, it, the Senate should not be the body that figures this out halfway through the legislative session that there are communities across the state that are going to be really significantly impacted by this, and we should have known earlier. Oh, I completely understand. Uh, so when did the administration understand that the burn rate was was running at this unacceptably high level? Based upon everything that I've been February in February, we recognized that the when the issue of eligibility really came to to light. That's when we, our estimates with regards to non-congregate sheltering went from an initial estimate of about anywhere between 30 to $50 million worth of exposure to 250 million. But when you guys, when the, the state provided, worked with FEMA in providing assistance to the residents of Puna, wasn't this issue the same, eligible and ineligible? I, I don't know about the no. Puna issue. The Puna issues, FEMA, were hardly was in the picture with regards to reimbursements. But but it to payouts. Yes. So we, we are bleeding right now. And it needs to stop. And I understand it's hard. Right? But there's no level set at, at this point from the administration about what the cost is to the to the rest of the operations of state government if we don't get this under control right now, right? Yes, that is a true. We have no idea what the impacts are right now. You are doing your best to understand it. Yes, sir. Because we still haven't gotten into what the real costs are in the additional three hundred fifty million that you're asking for. Like, that way, we can have a better understanding as to what was not anticipated. Correct. Because a portion of that is beyond just the non-congregate sheltering. If you look at the six hundred million in of yes, obligations no. that we have made, that's where I go back to with the governor's message. One one or two paragraphs doesn't really tell us a story as to why you really need the three hundred and fifty. There's no explanation as to what's in, what was spent and why and why you need that extra three hundred and fifty. So if the legislature and right now the Senate is the only one considering it, there's nothing that the House is looking at. So if that doesn't get passed, what's what's the consequence? What happens? 
I, I would have to get back to you on that one, Cher. I well, think the reality is yeah. you have a spending limit Correct. that's constitutional. You cannot go beyond that. So you're going to have to eat it from additional departments. We would have to eat it from additional departments or we would have to take a look at existing obligations of whether or not those would need to be de-obligated. So when the governor said at the press conference, including the $65 million for Wanahana, that he, he can do it on his own without the legislature, mm -hmm. that means it's going to come from the departments. I, we have not gone through that exercise yet. So I, I'm sorry. The, this goes beyond you. And the fact is, we need the governor to be here to stop the bleeding before we're going to be able to really provide answers to any of these hard questions. To um, top it off, we have collective bargaining. Where are we this year and, and next year? Pay. And hazard pay. And hazard, hazard pay. Still, pay. There's still some potential inflation with hazard pay, right? Increased cost for that. There is potential increased cost for hazard pay. There's also potential cost with regards to certain arbitration decisions that still need to come out. That's this year and next year as well. Yes, and okay. collective bargaining starts. Uh, we've already started. We've already started collective bargaining. Okay, you know, we're gonna have to end the info briefing and we can reconvene at some later point because we have to vote on this other measure. If not, there is no vehicle. Because it's awkwardly enough that the GM only identified that this is a vehicle we can use without any real information. It's, if you read governor's message three, which I encourage you all to read, should only take you a second because there's hardly anything in it. <laughs> um, but because we don't have time to go over all the details, we, I think members are still uncomfortable with the 65 million that we're gonna have to maybe potentially look for other vehicles to do with it. So I'll, I'll adjourn the, the info briefing and then I'll reconvene the, the agenda on 582. Okay. okay, so in regards to 582, some of the questions we don't have time for though is, all right, what's the cost containment plan so that we can afford the 65 million, right? Because that still has to, that's still on the table. Um, is that is statutory language really necessary or can we do this outside having to draft any new statutory language and three what happened to the foreign money that different countries provided in efforts of the relief that, those are questions that i'm commonly asked okay in addition to the last one where's our liability you know that that's where i think a lot of these could have been answered sooner but because we have a short time i don't think we're we're in a position to add it to the emergency appropriation right now we are gonna make, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to recommend that we amend the, um, we amend 582. That's a budget bill, yeah? That's yeah. State budget. Yeah. To just include uh, sweeping of transferring excess cash from non-general fund accounts into general fund for, for various accounts, which I, I passed out. And we'll defect the date to uh, 2050. And then we'll just wait to get from the administration a uh, much more detailed governor's message with all the specifics uh, that you would like to see in, in some some. Bill. Okay, any discussion? If not, uh, Chair votes aye. Pass with, pass with amendments. Speed 5A2, pass with amendments. Uh, Chair votes aye, Vice Chair votes aye, Senior Aquino. Aye. And Nikoi. Aye. And Hashimoto. Aye. Aye. No way. Senator Aye. 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 Aye.